This is lesson 7.4, the Pythagorean identities. In this lesson, the focus is on trying to prove and to apply the three Pythagorean identities that you see right here. First thing I want to start you out with, and we're going to elaborate on this a little bit more in class, but is where these uh, Pythagorean identities came from. The first one I just want to look at, and actually the only one right now, is going to be this first one right here. If you remember, if we have a, uh, a triangle right here, we know that this point is uh, point P is located at cosine of theta and sine of theta, all right? And so it would make sense then if we have a unit circle such that this is one, where my radius is one, that if you take this distance right here, whatever that distance is, and you square it, that would be cosine squared, and you take whatever this distance is and you square it, uh, that would be sine squared. It is equal to the hypotenuse squared, which is just one, and then one squared is just one. So this is where these, um, these identities come from, if you will. All right, so what we're going to be doing in this lesson is very similar to what we did with the previous lesson. We're going to be just using these three identities in order to um, work with um, um, some different proofs. Okay, So uh, like I did in the previous lesson, what I want you to appreciate is that these identities that I have um, above right here, they can be rearranged. All right, So if I was to um, start with the first one here, sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta, is equal to 1 like so, um, you can rearrange it in two different ways and that's just what I wanted to show you. Uh, if you want to isolate for sine of course you would have sine squared theta is equal to 1 minus cosine squared theta or if you want to rearrange for cosine squared theta you could do the same with um, sine squared theta being subtracted. Okay so that's the first one. Uh, the next one let's uh, take a look at this tangent one. So if we have tangent squared theta plus 1 is equal to secant squared theta, then what we could do is we could, if you wanted to, we could rearrange in terms of tangent squared theta, and so it would be equal to secant squared theta minus 1. Or if you wanted to rearrange um, and isolate for the 1, um, what you could do is you could have 1 is equal to, maybe I'll put the 1 on this side, 1 is equal to, and then move the secant squared theta over, such that you have tangent squared theta uh, minus secant squared theta is equal to that 1. Okay, So those are a couple different variations. Uh, the last one that I'll do right here uh, in orange um, is this one right here. So we'll start with 1 plus cotangent squared theta. And I think you're kind of getting the, the hang of this likely. But I just want you to kind of recognize, because you're going to be seeing these identities in many different um, forms. Um, they can be written different ways. So if I want to rearrange this one for maybe cotangent squared theta, it would just be cosecant squared um, theta minus 1. If I wanted to rearrange it for the 1 like we did before, it um, doesn't matter how you want to uh, situate it, but I'll just go 1 is equal to cosecant uh, squared theta minus cotangent squared theta. Okay, so similar to that one that we had right up there. Okay, so anyways, if you see any of those uh, identities, they all do come back to uh, these ones right here. Um, so make sure that uh, you're okay with that. All right, so let's go and try a couple of examples. So before we get started with the first example right here, a little quick note, it just says the Pythagorean identities, the identities we looked at on the previous page, they can be used to prove other identities, and so that's what we're going to do right here, or they can be used to simplify an equation before solving it. I think that'll be the last example that we take a look at. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at these. Um, the first thing I'm going to do right here is I see that we have cotangent theta plus tangent theta is equal to cosecant and secant theta. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the side um, that I feel is maybe more complicated, and that's going to be the left-hand side right here. And I'm going to write that side in terms of only cosine and sine. So I recall that cotangent of theta from our previous lesson is equal to cosine of theta all over sine theta. And tangent is just the opposite. It is sine theta over cosine of theta. Okay? And I'm not going to touch the right-hand side at all. I'm just going to try to work with this one side right here. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to go and get a common denominator right here. Okay? So again, the whole goal is that I'm trying to match it up with this other side. So if I get a common denominator, the common denominator is going to be sine of theta and cosine of theta. Right, which means that each one, so like my left hand side right here, the sine theta, the, the numerator and the denominator needs to be multiplied by what it's missing, which is a cosine theta. So that is going to become cosine squared theta. And then right here it's missing a sine theta and the denominator, so the numerator gets multiplied by the same thing. 
And so you're probably starting to see maybe one of these um, Pythagorean identities emerging, and of course it is. Um, let's just go briefly to the next page, or the previous page, but cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. Well, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta right here is equal to 1. So I can replace all of that with that identity with 1. So I now have 1 all over the sine of theta and the cosine of theta. All right, so that was just by using that identity. And the interesting thing with this is this is just saying that these are the inverse, right, uh, or the, the reciprocal. And so 1 over sine is the same thing as cosecant theta, and 1 over cos is the same thing as secant theta, like so. Okay, And so lo and behold, we have proven that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. So I'll just put an ls is equal to rs. Left-hand side equals right-hand side. Okay, let's go and try another one. So right here, um, we have cotangent uh, cubed theta is equal to cotangent theta all multiplied by cosecant squared theta minus cotangent theta. Again, I like to, whenever possible, try to deal with the side that looks more complicated. In, uh, in this one, I believe that's the right-hand side. Uh, what I would notice right here is it's always useful, um, as you've, you've seen in the last uh, probably two years in mathematics, is to try to factor whenever you can. And, and right here I notice that I can factor out a cotangent theta. So let's try and get rid of that. So if I take out a cotangent of theta, I now I'm left with in the brackets here cosecant. Uh, oops. I am now left with in the brackets cosecant squared theta just minus 1, right? And this, if you recall, is one of those Pythagorean identities. That identity says that that is all equal to just cotangent squared theta, right? And uh, that works out very nicely. This ends up being a relatively quick uh, proof right here. But if we multiply cotangent squared theta times cotangent theta, that gives you three of them. So cotangent cubed theta. Okay? And so we have both sides are equal. The left-hand side equals the right-hand side. Let's go to the next page. Now before I start this proof right here, the one thing I just want to remind you about is, is something that we would have covered in, in pre-calc 11. And it had to do when we had um, functions that look kind of like this, but specifically ones that had radicals in it. So imagine I had given you 1 all over, I don't know, let's go 2 minus the square root of 3. What we would try to do here is we try to rationalize the denominator because we don't want to have any radicals that are in the denominator. And how we did that was we multiplied by something called the conjugate pair. So we'd multiply the numerator and the denominator by exactly what you see right here, a 2 and a root 3, 2 and a root 3, but then we'd change the sign. And you might say, okay, well, why would we do that? Well, the benefit of doing that is in the numerator, we just get uh, these being multiplied. Okay, so that's nothing too exciting. But in the denominator here, we're no longer going to have a radical. We would get 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times um, root 3 gives you 2 root 3, but then you see 2 and the, um, the negative root 3 there it gets those two terms to cancel out. And then we get negative root 3 times a root 3 gives you just minus 3. And we no longer have a radical in the denominator. Now, that again is called the conjugate pair. Okay? And we're going to use that for this identity right here. So again, it was kind of a crapshoot um, as to which, which side you want to focus on, the left-hand side or the right-hand side. And so what I notice right here is that I have the 1 plus cosine theta. So I'm going to be able to deal with it in a similar way as I did over here in this little example when I was rationalizing the denominator. So uh, what I'll start out with is I will take sine of theta all over 1 plus cosine of theta, and I'm going to multiply it by its conjugate pair, which is just going to be the opposite of what you see here. So it's going to be 1 minus cosine of theta and 1 minus cosine of theta. Okay. Now the advantage of doing that is what you're going to get now here in the denominator. 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times negative cosine theta, and then 1 times positive cosine theta gets those two terms to cancel out. A negative cosine theta and a cosine theta gives you minus cosine squared theta. Okay. In the numerator now right here, I would just have sine theta all multiplied by 1 minus cosine of theta. Okay. Now you might be able to see kind of where this is going. I already have the 1 minus cosine of theta where that matches the left hand side right there, so that's good. If I could somehow get rid of this sine theta, oh I can, right? If you take a look, 1 minus cosine squared theta right there, there's an identity that says that that is actually equal to the sine squared theta. Okay, so I write this then as sine squared theta. Okay, so we're getting there. Now again, I need to somehow get rid of this sine theta, but I look, 
and I can see that these two terms right here I can indicate by just cancel them out like that and like that are going to cancel and so our final simplified identity right here um, just has one minus cosine theta all over sine of theta and notice that these sides match and so we can say that the left hand side is now equal to the right hand side okay and so that was a strategy by using um, what's called the conjugate pair okay all right so B here uh, again, I'm going to start with the side that looks more complicated. To me, that is the left-hand side right here. And so right here, what I see is I, I see a, a question that is similar to the, the previous two. It kind of combines everything. I notice that I probably want to get a common denominator right here. And then when I get a common denominator, lo and behold, it's going to be a conjugate pair. So if I multiply this times this right there, uh, which is what I'm going to do, I end up getting 1 times 1 is 1. And then the two middle terms cancel, and I'm just left with minus cosine squared theta. Okay, and I'm going to be able to reduce, uh, or going to be able to use an identity to change that in a second. Now in the numerator, what I would do is this 1 plus cosine of theta, that was multiplied by that side, so that'll get a 1 plus cosine of theta up here. And then on this other side, the 1 is going to be multiplied by the 1 minus cosine of theta. Okay, uh, what I will do now is I will go and I will simplify my numerator. Notice that these two terms right here are the opposite, so those will cancel. And so now I'm left with just 2 in the numerator, 1 plus 1 all over 1 minus the cosine squared theta. Okay. Now using that identity that I know, 1 minus cosine squared theta, that is just the same thing as sine squared theta, like so. And then I'm getting really, really close. I already have the 2 that matches with the right-hand side, but I need to get this cosecant squared theta. Well, this is technically just 1 over sine squared theta. So this is really equivalent to me saying 2 cosecant squared theta. All right, and so I have proven that the left-hand side here is equal to the right-hand side. Right, both sides are equal to two cosecant squared theta. Okay, last but not least, example three here. It says use algebra to solve the equation three minus three cosine x minus two sine squared x equals zero over this domain. And so this was that other um, type of question where we're not proving an identity right now. We're using these identities to help us solve something. Okay, so let's start out with the question that we have. We have 3 minus 3 cosine x minus 2 sine squared x equals 0. Okay, and what I'm going to use right here because I want to get everything in terms of cosine. The advantage of getting everything in terms of cosine here is I notice that this is likely going to turn out to be a quadratic. I have a term that's being squared. I have a term that is not squared just to the power of uh, or degree 1. And then I have my constant. So if I go and use an identity right in here, I can put everything in terms of cosine. Because I know that sine squared theta is equivalent to me writing it as minus 2. And then now right here, I can use the identity that sine squared um, theta or sine squared x is equal to 1 minus cosine squared x. Okay. So the benefit, again, of doing that is that now I have everything in terms of cosine. So if I go and use the distributive property, this gives me 3 minus 3 cosine of x minus 2, and then this negative 2 gets multiplied by this, which gives you a positive 2 cosine squared x equals 0. Gathering my like terms now and putting in descending order of powers, so that's important to do that all at once here, is going to give me the 2 cosine squared x, so that came out first, minus 3 cosine of x, a 3 minus 2 gives you a positive 1 is equal to 0. Okay. Now at this stage right here, you are able to factor. All right? And so I'm going to use the uh, decomposition method. Sometimes uh, I've nicknamed it with my students the AC method. When we do that, we're left with A times C is equal to, so we'd have 2 times uh, 1 is equal to 2. What numbers multiply to give you 2 that have a sum of negative 3? Those numbers, of course, are negative 2 and a negative 1. So I'm going to go and split up this uh, equation right here as being 2 cosine squared x minus, and rather writing 3 cosine x, I'm going to use these two numbers as negative 2 cosine of x minus cosine of x. That's just the 1 right there. And then plus 1. Okay. What can you factor from your first two terms? I notice that I can factor out a 2, and I can factor out a cosine x, which leaves you with cosine of x minus 1. Right here, I know I want to make this cosine of x minus 1, so what do I need to factor out of this to make that happen? That would be a negative 1. And now I have my two factors. My first factor being 2 cosine of x minus 1, and the other one being 
cosine x minus 1. Okay. And so notice that I've set each of these equal to 0. I didn't really need the brackets right there. Um, so those are my two factors. I've set them equal to 0, and then I can go and solve each of them. Okay. So when I solve each of them right here, um, on the, the left-hand side right here, I'm left with um, when I move the 1 over and then divide by 2. So I'm doing that kind of all in one step that gives me cosine of x is equal to 1 half. And the other one right here is just cosine of x is equal to 1. Now recall that we are doing it over the domain of between 0 and 3 pi over 2, right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reference my cast rule. So I have cosine of x is equal to 1 over 2. That would put me in this quadrant right here and would put me in this quadrant right here. But notice that that answer is not in the domain that we were looking for. Because remember, 3 pi over 2 brings me right to this point right here. So that means I only have that as a possible solution. So I would label my sides as being a 1 and a 2, which would technically make this root 3. I know that opposite of root 3, I have 60 degrees, but I'm in radians, so this would be pi over 3. Okay, And so I can say that this is equal to pi over 3. All right, if we come to the other side right here, let's see what we have. Again, we have um, cosine is equal to a positive quantity, so that would put me in quadrants 1 and 4, but just for the same reason over here, we couldn't have 1 in quadrant 4. Um, we don't have to worry about that. We label our sides. This would be 1 over 1 right here. Okay, so this makes that, um, that kind of imaginary triangle where this side would end up being 0. And so where does this actually collapse to? That's the way I like to think of it with my students. Well, because it does not have a height, this would just collapse right down to the x-axis right there. And so our answer for x would be x is equal to 0. Okay. So these being the two final solutions. All right. Um, so that concludes this lesson. What we've been uh, taking a look at is we've been taking a look at different identities. Today it was the Pythagorean identity. Um, and we saw how we can use that to prove uh, different identities and also like in this example how we can use it uh, to solve an equation. Alright, that completes this lesson. Thank you very much.